A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Ain Al-Rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Respected viewers at Imam Hussein TV3 Salaamun Alaikum Wa A'adham Allah Ujurana Wa Ujurakum On this uh, occasion of the Istishhad, the martyrdom of Sayyidat Nisha Al-Alameen I'd like to welcome you to our new weekly show, the Thursday Night Talk And uh, for this night's program, we have a discussion on the topic of racism and joining me to discuss the issue of racism within our communities, I have an elite panel of guests joining me tonight. From our guests on my far left-hand side, we have Haji Gulam Damji, who is an active member of the uh, Hyderi community in South London. He's been previously the chairman of Hyderi Sports Association and is currently part of the very important burial committee. To my immediate left, we have uh, Mr. Ahmed al um who is a student of law himself. He has been uh, working uh, in the field of PR for a number of Shia organizations and uh, has also been in the position of uh, advisory positions for a number of Shia charities uh, in and around London. On my right-hand side, we have the very well-known Haji Abu Shabaj, is a very active member within the uh, Shia community, a known poet, lover of Ahlul Bayt, has got uh, tons of backgrounds when it comes to charity work and an avid sportsman within our community. To my far right, we are also honored to be, we are honored to have the presence of Sister Rebecca Masterton, the uh, director of online Shia studies and the lead lecturer and researcher in Shia studies, uh, who has also specialized in the history of esoteric knowledge. To my esteemed guests, salam alaikum wa rahmatullah, and uh, welcome to the show Thursday night talk. Jumping right into the topic in regards to racism within the Shia community, specifically speaking. And before we delve into this conversation, um, as has been set as a precedent by our scholars, particularly when you come and you study ilmul, uh, ilmul mantik and in logic, whenever any issue or any concept is discussed, the first step is defining that concept, just so that we have the parameters of the uh, debate and the conversation set out. Having said this, there are two definitions that we are going to try and work around. One which is the more legalistic definition set to us by international bodies such as the United Nations and because we are Shia Ithna Ashari and uh, the belief that the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a word that encompasses goodness for all mankind, inshallah, we shall try and derive the uh, Quranic definition of racism as well. Having said this, to start out from the very beginning, you will note for reference over here, Surah Al-Rum, verse number 22. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And it is from amongst His signs, the plural ha over here returns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ From the signs of Allah that He has created the earth and the heavens. وَاخْتِلَافِ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ And He has created you with different tongues, different mother tongues, different languages, and even more explicitly, the Quran goes on to say, وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ And we have created you of different colors, different races, different ethnicities. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, within the diversity of our races and our ethnicities, there is the grand sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, I'm sure, as uh, we will engage with Sister Rebecca very shortly, whenever the word ayat is used within the Quran, ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is indicating towards one of those aspects through which not only the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be asserted, but the tawheed of Allah. For it would be fair to say that this issue of how we understand and how we deal with racism is greatly tied to our understanding of existence of Allah and Tawheed. If I put this out over here for the panel, um, Haji Ahmed, would you, be, would you enlighten us on legal definition of what racism is from you know, international bodies of law, for example? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi. Racism always is associated with discrimination. 
uh, post uh, Second World War, when people um, started to uh, discriminate against certain group of uh, individuals, especially if we you know, put this between a bracket, especially in the United States, for example, they had uh, in a one um, building, they had two different bathrooms, colored and white and so on. And um, United Nations comes and uh, puts um, some declaration for all countries to, to sign up to. And in the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, which is after the Second World War they created, we've got minimum two articles uh, talking about race, uh, language, gender, they say skin color, religion, and so right. on. <clears throat> Do they have a specific definition of what racism is, per se? Um, you see, let me, let me read you from um, Article 2 of the uh, United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, where it says, everyone is entitled to all rights and freedom without discrimination based on race, gender, culture, and so on. And also Article 16, where it says man and woman, is, this is uh, it's about marriage. Again, man and woman, when they uh, reach a certain age, for example, full age, without any limitation due to, again, race, discrimination, nationality, religion, and so on, can get married sure. and found a family. So, in essence, discrimination based on race yeah. is forbidden. Of course, on, the on Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is established in 1948. Mm. Tayyip, um, if I was to just to put you on hold over here and return back to our panelists within the guests, Sister Rebecca, anything that comes into mind in regards to the issue of discrimin you know, anti-discriminatory rules or regulations within our Shia school of teachings that would match the level of what is stated by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Well, we can see just from the practices of the Ahlul Bayt, salam, <clears throat> particularly with regard to marriage right. as well, that uh, there was not an issue of uh, discriminating against people based upon their racial background. I mean, even as we know, there are ahadith from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his holy progeny, where you know, he very, very famously says, there is no difference between uh, the black and the red, so to speak, except, you know, in piety. So, you know, you are only differentiated in the sight of Allah um, according to your devotion to Allah. But then we can see with regard to, uh, as an example, the women that the imams married, they married women from a wide range of backgrounds. Sure ethnically different yeah. from the predominant Arabs and the yes. Arab tribes within Hijaz. They, they could have married noble Arab women, but <clears throat> instead when you look at, uh, you know, when you look at um, their biographies and how many children they had, you will see that a lot of, well, not, you know, many of the Imams, the, the women are not identified, but they're called Umm Walad or else they're known to have come from, say, North Africa or Al Nuba, as an example. Right. So, um, and and of course, they were women who were usually employed in the house. So they were not from the noble Arab families of Mecca. And you would think that the imams, being from the lineage of Bani Hashim, carrying the lineage of Rasulullah, would only marry from prestigious Arab tribes or Arab yeah. families that are there within the vicinity. In fact, if memory serves me right, um, perhaps from the seventh or eighth Imam onwards, you will find that they married women who are from predominantly from North Africa. Um, we have within our hadith, for example, as well, or the books of history, that the eleventh Imam himself, Sayyidah Narjis salam, was from Rome as well. Um, for this idea of uh, engaging within the institution of marriage from different ethnicities, different races, definitely shows um, the example in terms of this is the manhaj, them being models of emulation for us that when they have married into different cultures, yeah. Islam in itself or the teachings of Ahlul Bayt specifically have a zero tolerance level 
um, when it comes to racism, or that race should not even be that barrier even when it comes to marriage. Um, having said that, I think even, you know, the, the, the saying of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam, that a person or a man is either your brother in faith or your brother in humanity. These are statements that need to be seen that are emanating from a head of state, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, in addition to being a divinely chosen imam by Allah azza wa jal, a head of state. And when a head of state utters a statement such as a person in this regime or in this domain, within this Islamic empire, within this Islamic nation, if you say, is your brother in faith or your brother, regardless, is either your brother in faith or in humanity, it just cuts out the root of any sort of discrimination. I would actually come forward and say, be bold enough to say that Tashayyu and Shiaism should be proud in that. We have legislature which which, which goes ahead and condemns racism and actually predates 1948. In fact, in you know, a very brief research that I was doing, there was something very interesting that I came across over here, and this is the UK law on racism. And um, it was only until 1965 that the Race Relation Act was actually, as the first piece of legislation within the United Kingdom to address racial discrimination. Uh, this is just as recent as 1965. And then further research, I found out from the Institute of Race Relations that in the year 2013 and 2014, there were 130 reported racial incidents per day in England and Wales. Now, my question over here is directed to two of my guests, um, Haji Gulam Damji and to Haji Abu Shabazz. I mean, yourselves, living here in the UK for quite a bit of time, um, outside of the Shia world, or maybe even within the Shia world, would you say that you have been, at some point at your time over here in the UK, ever been a victim of racism? Um, in your personal experiences, per se? Yeah, assalamu alaikum to everyone. Um, yes, um, I came over at a very young age from Africa, uh, studied here, uh, educated here, at that time in the um, 80s, uh, there was a lot of racism at that time as well. Um, you know, we've been subjected, well, I've been subjected to racism within school, uh, in college, etc. cetera. Um, people of the boat or whatever it was, um, right. more probably stronger words than that. But, uh, you know, to race, especially, I mean, my origin is from, from India, sure. but obviously, um, you know, if you were brown, then you were assumed to be from Pakistan. Right. Um, so th those were always um, barriers and, and hurdles that we had to face growing and up. And was this predominant behavior or isolated cases, you would say? Was this the predominant was, yeah, mentality it was predominant. of it was quite the rife. community here? Yeah, it was quite rife at that time. Within the 80s. Would you agree, Abu Shabazz? Um, yeah, so one of the things I'd like to say personally is um, I'd have to give great credit to British society, yeah? Um, I was born in this country, I've been brought up from a young age in this country. So, <clears throat> the first 20 years of my life, there was a high level of racism right. uh, across all angles. Um, the, the, I used to go to football matches from a kid. Right. The word Paki was something that I accepted. If I go to a football match today, anyone uses that word, they'll get a banning order. For they won't be allowed to come and watch a game of football. If I'm not so, mistaken, within the Champions League as well, they have the uh, anti-racism uh, campaigns that actually well, happen on Champions League nights. Well, what I'd like to say is that in British society, um, they have generally stamped out the problem. They've worked very well to integrate people. Um, there's a lot less racism. Racism will always exist. We must look at racism from a different aspect. There's religion. And the saying you said about Imam Ali al-Islam, um, where he turns around and says, uh, um, if you are not my brother in religion, you are my equal in humanity. Sure. Being equal in humanity means whether you are from a different religion, different color, you no look different, whatever. You are my equal, you're not lower than me, sure. but you're not higher than me. Sure. The word race, racism comes from the word race. Race comes from a 16th century French word. Uh, the word is actually raza. And it actually means to, it means creed or breed. Okay, so what happens with racism, we may look at racism in British society and say, okay, let's talk about, you know, how 
people were racist towards black people, people were racist towards Asian people, people are racist towards Islam, you have Islamophobia, you have Shiaphobia, etc. Right. so on and so forth. Let's go back a little bit and let's, let's look at our own societies. Um, for example, if you're from the West Indies, um, you're both of one colour, you both look the same, but you're a small islander or a big islander. If you're from India, you're poor or rich. This is also a form of prejudice. Racism isn't only about the color of your skin, it's the society you belong to, sure. where you look down on someone as lower than you because of a difference and because of your belonging. Of course. So if you, if you I'm sure, I know the Iraqis have racism with them, north and south. Um, Arabs have racism between dark and light. Right. Um, Khojas, a community that my mother comes from, have racism between whether you're an Indian Khoja or an African Khoja, if you're an African Khoja, whether you're from Dar es Salaam or from Nairobi or from Even Kampala. East Africa, and, a lot of it, and it goes right down because as human beings, we are sick in our nature. Um, so whether you're a white racist from the EDL or whether you're that Khoja who turns around and says, well, I'm an African Khoja and he's an Indian Khoja, right. or you're that Iraqi who says, well, I'm from South Iraq and he's from North Iraq. Sure. Um, what do Racism think, exists in human mentality. What do you think is mentality. this lead factor? What, what creates this innate feeling within me that I need to demonstrate superiority? It's egoism. For example. Okay, it's, 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 it's a complex, number one. It's that I'm better than somebody else. That comes from your own egoism. Right. One of the things about Imam Ali al Islam and why he could live with that thing, he had no ego. Right. We have ego, so... As a human being, I'm egoistic in the sense that I'm better than you. My community is better than you. We're more organized than you. We're better than you. Um, if, if you're white, oh, you were slaves. And, you know, we tend to believe that we're better than the person standing in front of us. Sure. And this is a problem we have because of a lack of spirituality. Because if we're spiritual, then we see each one and everything as equal. Uh, the uh, famous hadith about Imam Jafar Sadiq al-Islam where there was only two human beings and the rest were animals. Nobody's mentioned whether the human beings were black, white, brown, grey, short, tall. Sure. Yes? So this is to do with spirituality. So if you look from a spiritual sense, everybody is equal. There is no better or worse. If you look from, our, I would say, uh, animality sense, you know, you're the king of the jungle, you're the lion because you come from a better society, sure. right? So this is your animality within you, which sees you as better than other people. And this is where racism breeds from. And it's in all societies. I don't think we can talk about it in white British society only. Um, I think within our, ourselves, we're probably, because we're the minority here, we won't be seen as racist, but we're probably more racist than them. Sure. Um, Sister Rebecca, Within this context, so what we are able to gather is that, you know, the British society at a certain time was predominantly racist as well. And then we have a Shia community that's trying to operate within this wider community as well. The fact that we have Shia centers um, that are probably constructed, built, run based on ethnic divides. Um, you've got the Iraqi Hosseinia, for example. Um, you've got, you know, the Khoja centers. You've got the Pakistani centers. You've got the Lebanese. You've got the Iranians. I mean, the fact that our, our religious, you know, as Abu Shabazz has perhaps pointed out, that one of the lead reasons being lack of spirituality as a cause of uh, tendency to act in a racist manner, do you think that us constructing, building our Hosseinias, religious centers, for example, along ethnic divides, um, does this somehow contribute? Or have there, within your, big, your, your, your time, for example, within serving the Shia communities, have you seen any uh, upfront cases of racism in your experience? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think obviously people want to gather together <coughs> where they are sharing culture and language right. and even food uh, so they want to feel that familiarity um, and as Which I is possibly acceptable to a great extent yeah I mean as I've heard uh, from people who migrated here um, oh, as I've heard um, from people who migrated here uh, in the 70s and 80s when the Shia community was very small everybody used to go to one Husseinia and then the more people came in from different countries, then it started to split apart. The community started to split apart into different centers. Sure. 
so obviously as a convert, I tend to go to, or have gone to all different centers. I don't stick to just one center. Um, but I would say that, uh, I mean, people might think as well, because I'm European, that, that I might be always treated very fa favorably, but a lot of European um, or white converts are not always actually treated that favorably. Um, by by um, you know other Muslims um, and and is there a particular example that um, you would like to outline maybe in terms of us I think it's important to be able to point out certain cases to see does it qualify as racism and if it does um, you know what practical solutions need to be implemented mm -hmm. by heads of communities or people who are active within the general community to ensure that future generations or this behavior is not repetitive. Yeah, I mean, I well, I have, uh, I, I have, I know that, for example, with regard to marriage, um, even white converts have a difficult time marrying into a community. So, um, you know, as a white convert, you will be obviously maybe praised and mashallah because you've come from. Uh, European background, Europeans think they are superior to the rest of the world, but you've kind of turned your back on all of that and you've converted to Islam and well right. done. But that's kind of where it stops. So whether you're male or female European convert, um, it stops at, but we don't really want you in our family, you know. So, um, and, I, and, I, and I've spoken to, you know, male European converts and female um, converts as well right. uh, so so it's the same it makes it it makes it very difficult to find a suitable partner I don't know whether that's because um, among communities themselves they are equally I mean they're also discriminating against each other as well sure. um, another thing is that there is a uh, there's definitely seems to be a kind of racial pecking order so uh, I mean you know I know uh, a convert who's, uh, well, she was from a Sunni family, she's become Shia. Um, the family is Bangladeshi. Right. And um, so she doesn't fit in anywhere. Um, she doesn't fit in with Pakistani Shia. Doesn't everybody looks down on her. Yeah, everybody. She just doesn't yeah. fit inside that subcontinent. Yeah. She's at the very bottom, yeah. understood. So there's this kind of racial hierarchy. So, sure. Uh, Alhamdulillah, you know, I got married to someone from uh, Indian. Uh, background but when I did people were saying to me India I said but I thought you might marry like an Iranian or an Arab and, yeah this is so, the mental perceptions within people in yeah. the community I understand definitely perhaps one would be able to argue on the point of marriage that more than racism it has to do with compatibility um Yes, I mean, people think that obviously you, you, you want to, you're, you're very uncertain about someone who doesn't know the ways of your, of your family or your right. culture. So maybe people are kind of wary. You, uh, you have a mother-in-law who wants you to cook a very specific type of dish, for example. You've got a father-in-law who expects certain tasks from the daughter-in-law, so on and so forth. So culture does play its part to a certain extent. Yes. But I can understand it's a very fine line when a person tries to see compatibility between individuals' families and actually being racist. If I just um, you know, pause on this, uh, uh, on this conversation for a second and come towards you, um, Haji Abu Shahab, Haji Ahmed, very, you know, very lovingly known as Haji Abu Shahab, because you have been in PR, public relations for Shia organizations, you know, let me come out and um, don't mind if I put you right on the spot. Haji, we have Hosseiniyas that are established on ethnic divides. Language is a big issue. Um, if I was to bring any Shia person, a newly converted Shia person who has just embraced the wilayah of Amir al-Mu'mineen, bring him into the center, the speech is in Arabic, um, the people who are speaking are all shouting in Arabic. To make it worse, it's even different dialects inside of Arabic. And you know, the person is just absolutely feeling out of place. When we have issues, whether it's in regards to marriage, where it's in regards to new people who are embracing the wilayah of Amirul Mu'mineen, feeling like they don't fit in, 
People who are within the wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen can't fit in. Center that's running just Arabic programs. Center that's just running, for example, Urdu programs. And I'll come to you, Haji Gulam, very shortly on this. Haji, what's your opinion on this? You've, you've worked in the field of PR. Um, let's step back a bit. Um, before we um, see what the converse or um, a feel about marriage and others and integration within the certain, let's say, Arab societies or right. um, communities. Even just also on a program basis. Yes. Um, I think we have to see, we have to first educate ourselves. As you rightly mentioned and other uh, guests mentioned, that there's no difference between this person and that person. That's one thing. And one the... Um, in theory. Yes, in, I mean, yes, of course, yeah. And when you have a guest, a convert comes in to this center, to any other center, the best, I think the best thing to, th to say is to educate both sides, to, for the convert to say this community is the manner, the way they talk, the way they discuss it, or the way they accept the guest is in this way. And of course, for the community to explain people from different countries, different background, European or wherever, converted, and then they need to be welcomed into this society. So both groups should be educated about each other. Um, if they have knowledge about their uh, different people, different circumstances, different lifestyles, especially for people newly come to part of Ahlul Bayt alayhum um, would accept each other, it's a matter of acceptance, uh, to educate others about others, and also uh, going back to what Ahlul Bayt is saying, that a uh, rajul, or in, in Arabic, Imam Ali Ali said what the guest said as well, there's no difference between uh, Ahmar and Aswat. لا فرق بين عربيا وعجميا إلا بالتقوى. When I think for, when, when I dealt with these issues, one pe person comes in here, I try to explain how we do things in the center, for example. Right. With regard to accepting guests, with regard to, let's say, eating, with regard to programs, with regard to marriage, so many other things. When the person comes in, it's, it's not strange for him, sure. because he knows it already, or they know it already. And on the other hand, our community, just, it's a matter of education. Matter of education, who takes the onus, who take, how, how, you're in PR. What's the strategy that I put forward where we have free flow of movement and intermingling? Even, I don't think, personally speaking, I don't think this is an issue with people who have newly embraced the wilayah of Amir al-Mu'minin uh, against those who are already born inside of the faith because within the Shias themselves, if you were to gather you know, you were to do a statistical research and get a sample group of people from the Shias within London and ask this one who reg frequently visits Center A, how many times throughout a year have you ever gone and visited Center B, C or D and then do the same for the different centers that we have inside of Northwest London or South London, for example. And, you know, many times, um, I'll say this with all humbleness, that I've served as resident alim in two, in two different uh, community centers. And you see there is this um, sentiment of absolute loyalty, for example, where you could have two Hosseiniyas within, do you know what, a span of maybe half a kilometer, two kilometers apart from each other, but no one's visited, or very few people have sent, visited the other center. They've lived there their whole lives, but they've never really gone to the Imam Baga across. Why? Because this one's a Paki, this one's a Koja, this one's this, this one's that. What PR strategy? Um, Haji, Haji Gulam Damji, yeah. what's your take on this? Well, we've touched on several things here, and, and the main topic that comes out of it is culturism, our culture. Right. Culture is what is actually dividing us from following the Islamic path. Because in Islam, as you said, you read the ayat out, we made you in creed cultures different, so that you may mingle. Right. Now the practice is not quite there. Uh, it's quite evident that the practice is not there because we have different Imam Bargas, different Husseiniyas who commemorate in different ways, who celebrate in different ways. 
Okay. One thing we haven't touched on is Sister Rebecca mentioned uh, the European element of converting or reverting, whichever it may be, but we haven't talked about uh, converts or reverts who, who are black, who've come to our religion. Of course. Um, uh, this is no disrespect to anybody, but I can only give you my perspective of what racism feels like to me as a brown person. I could never, you know, um, stand here and say what a black person feels like. It would be nice to have somebody, perhaps on the panel, who could 100%. give their point of view. 100%, and this was uh, one of our goals as well. However, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, there were a number of cancellations. But um, definitely, I mean, the, the, the African <clears throat> brothers and sisters um, have an added, I would fairly say, an added hurdle to kind of overcome. I think we have a question from the audience as well. Um, Minhal. To the dearest uh, respected panel, um, I think one of the main questions is because the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family is seen as the exemplar for all Muslims, all uh, 1.6 billion Muslims around the world. Um, the real question is how did he deal with racism? As in, we see according to a BBC summary um, and some Islamic reference books, we see that um, that the Prophet and the Imams during their times didn't really deal with racism. You know, there were, there were slaves still about, um, and this sometimes included race. So can the respected panel... Let me just get a clarification in that Islam and the Rasulullah, or Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt did, did do or did not do? So they did not, because, you know, there was slavery, there, there were still slaves at that time. Right. And uh, this included uh, race and... Can, can you guys elaborate on how Rasulullah and the Imams Definitely, we'll that. address your question um, with quite a bit of detail and get back to Haji Gulam as well, but inshallah all this after a short break. Ahsantum. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, respected viewers and guests within our live audience. Welcome back to the Thursday Night Talk. And uh, indeed, quite a bit of an interesting discussion we've had with our esteemed guests within the panel in regards to racism, um, current day acts of racism within our communities. And um, there's a number of things that we've touched over here. One of them being, which I seem to see as root causes over here, lack of spirituality, which was pointed out by Haji Abu Shabazz earlier on on the show. And it seems that our affiliation with our culture and drawing the line between what is acceptable as holding on to cultural practices and turning that into something that leads to discriminatory behavior towards others within, uh, within the fold of Tashayu. Uh, these are the points that we have been coming towards over here. Before the break, a very interesting question by uh, uh, one of the brothers within the guests that apparently according to a BBC documentary is that Islam didn't do enough, the Holy Prophet of Islam didn't do enough in order to fight racism. And one of the evidence that is cited is that slavery um, was a rampant practice during the Islamic times. Um, I've definitely got a word to say over here, a word or two. With our panelists, anyone like to jump in and address the question? Yeah, um, I, I will disagree with that. Um, the biggest example, the earliest example, and the biggest example we can, we can give you is that of Hazrat Bilal, in terms of reciting the Azan. His pronunciation, because he was a black man, his pronunciation wasn't as it should be in Arabic. Um, Obviously, they said he shouldn't recite the Azan. You know the story. I didn't have to go into that one. So that's the biggest example. And just to add to I that, go? sorry, just to add to that point, the Adhan or giving the Adhan, reciting the Adhan is a very, very prestigious Indeed. position. And even when you look into the books of Fiqh, when you return back to the older books of Fiqh, what is at the top of my mind, Shara'i al-Islam by Muhakkik al-Hilli, uh, Rahmatullah alayhi, you will see that even the Adab and the Akhlaq of a Mu'addin the Mu'addin, the person who recites the Adhan, is supposed to have a certain number or certain type of, he's supposed to possess certain type of characteristics within him. 
that shows the elevation of his soul and his spirituality. You find that Rasulullah has given this prestigious position that perhaps a number of people were longing for from amongst the Ansar of the Muhajirin, the Ashab of Rasulullah, who would have loved to be in that limelight. It's a yeah. public position, by the way, being a Mu'addin. You're in the limelight um, three times a day, three adhan for five salat that are stipulated, and on the occasion when the salat was separated, five different adhans. Nevertheless, you are in the public light, and it's... It, it's a massive figure. You find that Rasulullah didn't give this to any of the tribes. He's given it to an Abyssinian slave who was then freed. And there is enough historical evidence just to show, Bain al-Qawsain, to put this between the brackets, that actually the liberation of Sayyid Bilal was done through the wealth of Sayyidah Khadija, Ummul Mu'minin. Salamu alayhi alayha. Tayyib, Abu Shahab. I just wanted to give an example to Brother Minhal. You know, Islam sat down gradually. It wasn't from day one Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi comes and say the slaves are free, for example. He was fighting the uh, kuffar. So few problems, problems in has defense. Yeah, of course, yeah, no, no, yeah. And educating. I always go back to this uh, word educating. That's one. Thing. 100%. The other thing is that two examples I want to give you. One is about Imam al-Sajjad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imam al-Sajjad all all MS, but in this example, Imam Sajjad used to buy these slaves from the market and free them. Say, You're free. Hur Allah, go. But the beautiful thing is that person, that is slave, which freed, said, I want to stay with you. The Imam Ma'asum Salam Allah. And then he stayed with Imam for years and years and years. That's one example. And the other one is Joan. In Karbala, is one of the companion of uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He was aswad, he was black. He comes to Imam and say, my, my, my color is aswad, black. And um, um, it's like, say, my, my riha is netin, or um, um, it's a very bad kind of smell. Okay, I want to stay with you, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, until my blood is mixed with your blood, aswad. And instead with the Imam, of and course. then what we do, Imam Sadiq alayhi salam teaches us, where so when you stand, someone says, yeah, Imam, how do I... Go for ziyar to this uh, uh, shuhada. Say, stand, and then say, Bi abi antum wa ummi. That is my father and mother be sacrificed, sacrificed for you. For you. John, One of them is John Aswat. Have you seen yeah. ah, Santo. Uh, but also, Miqdad um, um, uh, and Amar ibn Yasser were also African. So, um, you know, out of... Uh, the four prominent lovers of Ahlul Bayt, lovers of Amir Mu'manin, alayhi salam, um, two of them were, uh, and Miqdad was, uh, again, a very well-known, prominent uh, horseman as well, very skilled horseman. Another issue is that um, we can see what Amir Mu'manin, alayhi salam, did when he finally got those four years as, um, as caliph, after the first uh, three khulafa, because it was Umar ibn Khattab who had tried to promote Arab superiority, um, and you know by by giving more uh, higher stipends to Arabs than to non-Arabs, uh, and had made moves to prevent. Uh, non-Arabs from coming into Arabia for too long. He put restrictions on non-Arabs coming into trade. Yeah. Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he um, became caliph, one of the first things he did was to equalize the stipends of the soldiers um, who were working for the state. <clears throat> and of course, that did not make the members of the Arab tribes happy. And that's one of the reasons why they didn't give him a lot of support against uh, Ma'awiyah, you know, when it came to the Battle of, uh, of Safin. Um, so, so we can see through his economic... Um, Means he, he, I mean, he worked to correct a lot of what the previous khulafa had brought and in. Arguably, what you could say is just to add to this point, Sister Rebecca, that this is now Amir al Mu'minin. Um, he's been the Imam, whether the people have accepted him or not, obviously. Just now that the Dahira Khilafah is given to him, when he implements strategies such as this, we can safely assume that this is legislation being passed. Yeah. So, the Islamic government or the ruling government of the time is passing down legislation to eliminate racism 
from a governmental perspective, any sort of discrimination or prejudice based on race, based on ethnicity, for example, based on political affiliation. Yeah. Because Amir al-Mu'minin's government, yes, he was leading the government from Kufa, but a number of people were not even supporters of the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'minin. A lot True. of them had their loyalties towards, um, towards Muawiyah, a lot of them had Uthmani, what is known within the books, they had Uthmani affiliations. Despite that, Amir al-Mu'mineen, as you rightly says, gives or makes legislation, which is understood in today's language, puts out legislation that regardless of your political, regardless of your ethnic affinities, the stipend from the government is going to be won. Yeah. And it's surprising that for policies such as these, he ends up becoming a martyr. Yeah. Subhanallah. Abu Shabazz? Um, slavery was, Solid point, sister. Slavery was more a problem of povertyized nations. When we say the word slavery, the first thing, if I said to you, name a creed or people that were slaves, everyone would say Africa. Whether you're from white society, Asian society, Arab society. This was unfortunate because they were povertyized people. People can make documentaries and talk about Islam, but we must remember 16th, 17th, 18th century, what happened to black people in Australia by educated, what we consider the educated white civilization, Australia, Europe, and America. They were brought over as slaves 14, 15 centuries after Islam. Right. Islam had freed these people, had given them, where, where Sheikh mentioned and uh, Brother Ghulam mentioned, Hazrat Bilal, not only was he given the, um, the, the, the high accolade of reciting the Azan, when the Muslims regain Mecca, he was told to climb on top of the Kaaba and give the first call to prayer as the first calling to prayer in the city of Mecca. So we at Hadri, and I think even in all our centers now, we can show there is a fight against any form of cultural racism or any form of racism because we have uh, speakers from uh, African backgrounds who sit on our member who lead our prayers. We pray behind a black man. My this question, your oh, of course, the so even just, in sorry, Birmingham, within we a have question, it. Within a question, um, active steps that the Hosseinia or the Imam Barga that you attend to, hmm. what active steps would you say you're just proud of as a center? This is the biggest proof that your center in particular is not we were the first ethnically center, racist. The first center who made a full decision to have all our lectures in English so that everybody who came to our community could understand what was being said right. rather than it staying in our cultural language of Urdu. Um, so we changed, what, maybe 20 years ago. Everything's been in English from that day. Imam al Jama and speakers who are not from the subcontinent, for example. Yeah, um, and that's allowed us to have speakers from different areas as well. We have Arab speakers, we have Af African speakers. So, you know, we've had these sort of things. My bigger question is, I've always learned to, I've always learned from my elders or people that are above us. I went through Shia theology, etc., etc., and I'd like to ask you this, Sheikh. Has there ever been a black ayatollah? Because I don't believe that's either a statement of saying black people are not good enough to be ayatollahs because they're thick and don't understand thick, or there is racism within the marja system, and there has been for a long, long time. I don't, why isn't there a black? I went to Saudi Arabia. I saw a community of black people who originate from the holy fourth imam. And man, do they have knowledge. I didn't understand what they were saying, but the person who, who turned around and told me what they were saying right. was on a high level. But I asked one of them, how comes you haven't had a black merger? Haven't someone from your family ever become a merger? And the guy just pointed to the color of his skin. Very, um, a point that is absolutely sharp. Sharp as an arrow. Let me answer this because we have a question within a question and within a question running. So we just try to tie these loops up at the moment. Um, returning back to the question, before I get back to Abu Shabazz on this issue, um, when it comes particularly to slavery, I would highly contest the fact that even the statement which is made that Islam never did anything to abolish slavery. In fact, when you're looking back at the time of Rasulullah, the, the core ahkam shar'i, encompass and revolve around abolishing slavery. Ajib. How? 
when you refer back to the books of fiqh, you come and you look at a number of the ahkam when it comes to the kitabul ibadat, when it comes to kafara, at different number types, number of different sets of kafara within different categories. Some of them are based on uh, preference. Some of them are based on if this is not possible, then you should do this. Whether it is kafara, for example, for purposely breaking a fast at the top of my head during Shahru Ramadan, or going or breaking another, for example, or the kafara for a yameen, for example, you find that the manner to rectify this is what? One of the first options that is given to you, whether it's on the basis of option or obligation, is another thing. But you will find one of the solutions there is what? Atkur rakaba, to free a slave. Within the core of Sharia, Ibadah, you have transgressed against your Lord. The first way to fix this is to try and abolish slavery. You have, you have committed a sin against Allah, Azza wa Jal. You have violated the rights of the creator of the universe. He tells you, you want to fix relationships with me? The first thing you need to do is go and abolish. But at the thawab, when you come and you have a look at thawab that is mentioned within the hadith, the thawab of liberating a slave, Thawab of liberating a slave. The thawab is there for what? This is to show you that there is legislation in place within Islam that if you want to ascend within the ranks of spirituality, then go and free the slave. This is what? If you want proximity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've got to abolish that slavery. Yes, Rasulullah, and within the daydana of Islam is that abolishing slavery was not implemented by force. Just like any other aspect in religion, la ikraha fid din, there was a greater hikmah because it's not only abolishing slave trade, but it's about the victims of slavery, how they are now going to be integrated within wider society. And which is why you have the nautical Quran Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. The seerah of Imam Sajjad is a reflection of the teachings of the Quran as per the school of Ahlul Bayt, the Quran is the example, they're the, they're the personification of the values within the Quran. When Imam Sajjad, year in, year out, liberates a hundred slaves, this shows you that the vocal Quran is taking a stance against slavery. So where does the idea come that Islam didn't do, against, uh, didn't do anything against slavery? Something that was highly contestable. I think we have a second question from the crowd before I come back to Haji Abu Shabazz. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so, Assalamu alaikum. Sorry. Just from what Abu Shabazz Hello was saying, um, yes. I've been working in the community for more than 10 years, and um, I completely agree with Abu Shabazz. There is um, a great deal of systematic racism, and there's nothing that you, our panelists, could say to sugarcoat it. Yes, there is no racism. Racism in Islam is not acceptable, and it has no place. But regardless of what you say or how you say it, <laughs> we're racist. The Shia community are incredibly racist. I've worked for the Stanmore community, I've worked for Hyderi, I've worked for multiple board broadcasting stations, you know, the Pakistani community. I mean, I find it quite incredible that, you know, people stand up here, sit here, and they say, oh, no, no, you know, Hyderi, like, or Stanmore, or whatever centre there is, oh, there is no racism. There's systematic racism, not only within your schools, but within your mosques and your communities. And I'm just wondering, um, as panellists representing those communities, what are you doing about it? Perfect. Before we answer this question, and we're getting into a loop where we have questions within questions piling up, let me get back over here to Haji Abu Shabazz's question in regards to... Marja'iyah, um, you know, the claim that is put forward is that because we have not had an African marja, for example, that means or there is, or a black Arab marja, for example, that means that there is racism within the institution of marja'iyah. Is this a claim that can be attested with evidence or not? What I can say to you is this, that, and what I can safely say for you within Hausa Zainabiyya, because these are the environment with which I've been exposed to, mm. so it would be unfair and um, it would be speculation if I was to speak about a greater Hausa setting, which I've not been a part of, within Hausa Zainabiyya and within the Hausa Ilmiya and Najaf al Ashraf, for example, you will find that within these scholarly institutes, the only merit that you possess is your academic strength. So the, the, the depth of research, 
your aptitude when it comes to books of principles of jurisprudence, your ability to research, your ability to understand and analyze hadith, this is the grounds of respect within Hawza Ilmiya. And within Najaf al Ashraf and what used to be of Hawza Zainabiya back then, you will find that anybody of any color, if he's able to go there and establish his strength, and I'm not saying that perhaps African people haven't done this, but what we need to do is that if we're going to identify or we're going to come forward and put a claim that there is racism against black scholars that is preventing them from being declared marajat taqlid, now what we need to do is we need to have historical evidence where a black alim, for example, is brought forward we need to see where are his researches, what were his talks, where did he reach in regards to the level of ijtihad, and why was he denied, for example, a license of ijtihad? All well and good, Sheikh, but as a layman, right. um, let's go back 20 years. Was there an Arab footballer? No. Was there an Arab well-known footballer? No. no. There's loads now. Every community produces gems and pearls. Sure. If you're going to sit here and say to me, no black man has reached that level, no, then I'm that so is sugarcoating it. What I'm saying is that we need research and we need evidence. Well, the Where problem is, the is if you the went... evidence is based on research. If we went for to example, these institutions... Sorry, for example, somebody comes and says to you, we haven't had the Marjat Taqlid from Kirman Shah. No. Does that mean that I the Hausa Ilmiya is racist against Kirman Shah? No, but I think... The, I, the no. township or the city think, of Kirman Shah? I, I think a small town compared to a whole race... Okay, Africa contains so many countries. Blacks exist in Arabia in a high level. how many of them have gone and spent time in Hausa to the level to no. attain Ishtihad? No, just interrupt that. How many of those have been invited? Or accepted? Accepted an invitation oh. is two big different things. But because you have, we, we can't we sit here. We have a big movement. Sheikh, we can't sit here and say, okay, no black man has reached that level. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not saying that either. What we've I'm had a black we president in evidence. the United States of America. Some of the best university lecturers come from those backgrounds. Of Black course. people are very intelligent. My, my, friend's, my friend's father is a head judge. Um, you know, my, one of my friend's father has written books on law. Another one, he's a, one of the top consultants. Okay? They are intelligent. There is no way that within the society of uh, Islam, Shia jurisprudence, you know, no black guys come forward who's had the ability I agree with you 100%. There has to be some form of racism. We can't just sugarcoat it and say, well, you know what, no one's been at that level. It's all like a, there is racism. There's racism within our Hausa institutions. You're a sheikh. You may not want to say this. You're not in a position to bark and tell you I've been, when Syria was there, I've seen the racism towards black people, Azeri people, non Iranian people, not Pakistani or Pakistani people. Even within Hausa systems back in Syria, you had the Pakistani Hausa and the Iranian Hausa. Right. Yeah. Look, if we're going to deal with racism with Shia Islam, it's got to start up there. It's right. from our teachings. Our teachings come from those who give us our laws and regulations. Of course. So when you say racism within the Hausa, again over here, what you're saying is that you're making out a, a blatant claim that there is discrimination Absolutely. and research being shunned Absolutely. Because of color. Totally. And there's circumstantial evidence to back this as well? Well, the fact what, is that if you go to no, any Hausa... No, I'm asking circumstantial evidence per case. Yes look, or no, before I, we move on. I'm, I'm in no position to go and do um, research because I'll probably get shot. But at the Anyone end who's day, come forward to you, for example, from, from the African I community... I told you, I told you, I went to Medina. Um, there is, and you can verify this, there is a black community, I forgot what they go by, uh, who are actually descendants of the Holy Fourth Imam. Right. They are highly educated, they're very um, pious, they're very spiritual people. Um, they've said it to me themselves. They just pointed to the color of uh, their skin. Can I, can so we have a very interesting turnover here. Yeah. In regards to racism within the highest educational seminaries that are there, and we have one case of a person who's come forward. Can this one person uh, who has come and said based on his color, he's not been allowed to progress. Circumstantial evidence that can be shown over here that the Hausa Ilmiya actually bars colored people and discredits their research. This is the point that I'm well, looking for here. Cir well, circumstantial evidence uh, may not be in terms of, you know, um, 
in writing or whatever, in physical, but you've got to ask the question, are there any alims or marjas that are going to houses that are from the ethnic, you know, from, uh, from, the, from a black background? What you've just mentioned there, there's a, there's a personality in Nigeria who's done some wonderful work there, you know, for the Shia community. Sheikh Zakzaki. Zakzaki. Sheikh Zakzaki. You know, is there any support for him? Let alone inviting him or whatever. Right. In terms of from our mergers, I, uh, from this my is limited knowledge, because there don't is, think so. um, there is, uh, politics that is involved as well, number of amount of people or the different type of peoples, whether they want to be involved in politics, want to be apolitical, but putting forward the claim that we're not going to support ex sheikh just because his color is black. Again, looking around those lines, Abu Shahab, your take on this. Yeah, what I wanted to speak about is, uh, sorry about this subject, just one minute just to go back. Um, after the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, right. European Convention on Human Rights created, and in 1998, UK created, enshrined all those laws into a UK law, which right. is called Human Rights Act. Okay? United Nations, Europe, England in particular, all are saying about race, language, color and so on within the last 60, 70 years. But 400, 1400 years ago, what I would say this one, okay, Islam, one of the brothers, I think Brother Shawas mentioned that we brought the racism into this religion. Quran says Surat Al-Hujarat. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayuhal ladhi, ya ayuhal nas, anna khalaqnakum in dhakarin wa untha, male, female, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ilan, lita'arafu. Okay, what is this? We created you from male and female and created you into nations and tribes and so on. For what? To get to know each other. And we've got all these differences. Okay, what the ayah is saying, inna akramakum and Allah atqaakum. So the, the best way to uh, get all this racism out of the way is a taqwa. Okay. Again, again, it comes from education. When someone, a pious people, a group of pious people, but they do not have racism within them, you take Ahlul Bayt, alayhum as -salam. Of course. Salamullah alayhim, 14 infallibles. You can't see a dharra racism between them or from them towards Or within others. their teachings, to yeah. say. Yeah. And going back to the uh, scholarly uh, questions you're asking, I think... Personally, I think it's not about me inviting or how it comes and invites someone from, let's say, uh, black background comes and say, come and study and to go house and become a merger. It's the person themselves or the group themselves need to have self-esteem and confidence to go up. If I think, as a, as a black man, I've been slaved and, uh, for example, races against me or discrimination against me and so on, I would step back. But so I think those communities, which are, or have been labeled as a slave, they need to step up. Okay? And other mergers, other scholars, other communities need to, again, educate. Educate about the different the, uh, communities. Ahsan, I think the key is education, but I think another point over here is also understanding how the Hausa structure works um, over here. I'll answer that to you in just a quick second. Sister Rebecca, any take on this? Um, racism within Shia educational centers, seminaries perhaps is at the highest level? Well, obviously, I mean, I haven't gone through Hausa, so, but I can only... <clears throat> um, mention a few incidences that have been mentioned to me um, by um, one uh, scholar of African background. I mean, he said, as an example, in Qom, um, there were African students there who were Sayyid, um, but um, people in Qom couldn't believe that a Sayyid could be African. And right. so they would go up to the African Sayyids and shout at them and tell them to take off their black amama. This is where? In Qom. Okay. Uh, and also I have been told by um, an African sheikh that um, in 
certain uh, mosques, uh, they have been reluctant to have an African alim uh, speaking in their mosque or, you know, leading the leading the salah. Right. Um, so, uh, so there are definitely, um, you know, there's a, there's there's an attitude we could say. Uh, that that is there, but I think it's very difficult maybe to publicize it. Sure. Um, I think it touches a lot of sensitive chords over here. And um, I'll put this down for the record. Um, if we see that there is any sense of um, injustice happening, regardless of whether you're a scholar, you're not a scholar, if you're with Ahlul Bayt, your obligation is to speak. Absolutely. And um, I'd like to say that it's something that hopefully is a value that I myself or all of us over here are trying to uh, are trying to achieve and truth needs to be said now what needs to be done is just so that I can um, you know put a pause on this with um, uh, uh, on the Hausa issue and racism within the Hausa in itself and we've got a number of questions that are lining up as well but however let me say this um, I'm not going to be one who's going to hide and deny or do anything of the sort we have examples of prejudice happening within scholarly circles Okay, number one, this is not something that is confined to Ahauza Ilmiya, but it also happens, just if you hear me out, and it's not a justification, but this is not an issue which is exclusive to the Hausa. It happens in other scholarly sectors as well. Absolutely. It happens within Hosseinias as well. Absolutely. Certain people will only be invited or will be allowed to be a part of a management. So this issue is not just exclusive, number one, to Ahauza Ilmiya. This is number one. Number two, the other thing is that Hausa policy, Hausa mainstream teachings is one thing, and the people who are within the system and the actions of the people within the system is a different thing altogether. Just like the way we say Islam is one thing, Absolutely. and the action of the Muslims is one thing. Yeah. Hausa ilmiya in regards to what we say, Najaf al Ashraf, the legacy left behind by Sheikh Tusi and the stronghold and the bedrock of Marja'iyya as an institution, upholds the teachings of Ahlul Bayt and keeps alive the teachings of Tashayyu throughout time. Within that institution, if there are individuals who have come up, and who have prejudice and exercise racist behavior towards any other student of Ahlul Bayt, then yes, they need to be condemned. Why? Because their presence there stains the institution of the Hausa. So what I would say is the Hausa as an institution is pure in its teachings. Perhaps the actions of the people inside over there, if they have these tendencies between or tendencies within them, that needs to be addressed, it needs to be corrected, it's not correct. One other thing, let me just say over here before we move you on. When it comes to marja'iyya as well, many times, many times, well, I don't even need to go and take permission. I will say this, it might be a very unpopular comment, but I don't need to go and take permission from A, B, C, or D to go and announce my ijtihad mm -hmm. or my marja'iyya. If a person feels truly that he's from the African descent or black person and I'm truly an ijtihad, I reached the level of marja'iyya, well, you know what, if you've been a victim of, if, if, if hypothetical, if you have <coughs> been a victim of racism within the marja and they didn't allow you or endorse you, baba, by step them. Announce your marja'iyya, inshallah, and you will get 50 people, 100 people, there inshallah, is a, 50 there million is a guy people. in America, the guy who translated the first volume uh, of Al-Kafi. I'm sure you're aware of him. Again, somewhat not accepted, but this is the subject. I just wanted to bring this out so we become free thinkers. Now, what I, would say, free what I would say... Real quick, because we have yeah. questions from... How, how did... How, within British society, my first statement I started with was that we've moved on, we've progressed a great deal. How did they come to that? They... They encouraged studies. They did internal studies. Of course. Um, they said, why isn't there black students at this university? Why isn't there Asian teachers? Why isn't there this? Why isn't there? And they did studies into these things. Why I ask that question is, up at that level, someone's got to say, why isn't there a black merger? Right. Why hasn't there been a black merger? But that's not for us to go in and study, because they're more knowledge than we are. Mm -hmm. It's for them to start off the... Um, uh, uh, process. Right. It's got to go the other way. Um, just quickly, uh, with regards to the sister, the question she asked. Look, in society, in communities, there is a few people who will um, always be racist. 
and they will be terribly racist. And I will give you one very simple example. I had a white friend um, who became a Shia Muslim and decided to donate money into the box. And I heard one of my uncles turn around and say, oh, did you see him, that Tariq boy? He was taking money out. Um, I really got upset because that's a really bad way of looking at things. But um, we, as youth, can see the humor in this, huh? and, and, and we, as, as I grew up as youth, um, we've had black Shia Muslims, white Shia Muslims coming to our community since 1992. The first English lectures ever in England, um, the whole 10 days, was done in 1992 in our community, and because we forced it, because we said these guys, they don't understand Urdu, blah, blah, so on and so forth, and alhamdulillah, it's had changes. We can always do our best. We will welcome them. In fact, if you come to Hadri, alhamdulillah, we do have people that come from different backgrounds. However, I'm sure they face racism. But you know what? It's like we grew up in this country. We just got to deal with it because there's good people and there's bad people. And if we're going to pick and say bad people, bad people, bad people, those same bad people, they'll be racist to people from their same society who are poor. That, that is also a form of racism when you prejudice someone against someone because there are many. Or someone who doesn't have boys for children, they'll be like, oh, he's only got daughters, like he's not a man. Or, this is the stupidity it gets to. Like I said, this is a lack of spirituality. A black man, a white man, an Asian man, a Pakistani, a Kojak, nobody's different. We're all the same. At the end of the day, if I need a heart transplant and my heart comes from someone from a different uh, background, it's still a heart. He still has the same feelings, the love, he feels exactly the same emotions that I do. The tears that fall from his eyes for Imam Hussein al-Islam are the same tears that fall from my eyes. His, made, his are probably more sincere. But unfortunately, in society, there's nothing we can do. As, as a panelist here, I do my best to welcome and, and you know, be very, very hospitable to anybody from any side of any community and any financial background. But there's always going to be the guy next to me who's going to be horrible towards him. Yes, we've had situations in our community which I'm embarrassed to even bring up. I'm embarrassed to even talk about, but we had a situation where we didn't bury it. Obviously, I can imagine there's a lot to say over here. I'm sorry I'm going to cut you short over here. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's a very emotional topic and um, obviously it's going to touch a lot of uncomfortable nerves the deeper you go into it. But this is a topic that needs to be addressed over here. Um, individual effort is very important. Countering ignorance is important. We have a question that's coming down from the guest side as well, from the Sorry, sister can side. I, can I, before we take that question, let's just take a question sure. because they've been asking sure. for quite some time. Sorry, Haji Gulam. Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. Alaykum My question is about this issue of um, which has been raised by <clears throat> a number of the panelists about spirituality, about taqwa, about education. Um, I've been thinking from another perspective as a psychologist. I'm thinking that we are, as human beings, it's natural for us to judge. And judgment is is normal, it's very ordinary, and it's part of our uh, being, and it's a part of our trying to understand the other. One of the things that we do as human beings is to other people. There's different diversity, and when we other people, we put them in a different category to ourselves. We have in-groups and out-groups, sure. and unfortunately, racism and discrimination and prejudice arises from <clears throat> othering people. One of the things I've seen in the Husseiniyas, in our Imam Bargas, is that the more that we have um, <clears throat> togetherness and we come together, we understand each other. So I, right. from, from my perspective, I think it's quite natural that we want to come together in our own communities because we know our communities. And as human beings, we feel quite comfortable with what we know. We're within we, the safety zone, the comfort zone. Exactly. We want to stay in our comfort zone. We want certainty. We want assurance. When we see something different, Different, we're shaken, we don't have assurance, we don't know what to expect. So first of all, to say that this is quite a natural human um, way of being. Secondly, what I've seen is that there's a genera generational issue here. I'm actually quite um, very, very excited and very happy to see how in our different Husseiniyas which have sprung, which have mushroomed, there are many from all of our communities represented now, many, many more. I feel that the younger generations are very integrated. They assimilate with each other and they hold many programs together and there is no race um, discrimination between them. 
And what we've been talking about with the Hausa system, with some of the um, Stanmo or Haidari particular management structures, these are constitutional issues, um, especially re specifically related to some of this um, about being uh, who's allowed and who's not allowed on, in, in management structures. What I'm seeing on the ground is that there is some encouraging movement, especially from the younger generations, to come together. In and what sense would you be able to um, elaborate just one example of what you think the next generation is doing mm -hmm. to break this barrier of, of racism that is perhaps maybe from the generation before? I can give an example from my own um, profession. Please. So I work as a psychologist and we have a group uh, of psychologists, psychotherapists, and psychiatrists who come from Iranian, Khoja, Indian, Pakistani, black, all, all communities. Um, the, we come together because of our profession. And it is a, you know, it's a lovely feeling to be together. I go to our Ahle Sunnah brothers and sisters, psychology professional groups, and they look at us with envy and say, we are a Sunni community, very, 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 um, diverse and we're dispersed and we're dispersed on national and racial lines. I find that we as a smaller community are much more based around our faith-based issue. So in our psychology and mental health meetings, for example, we have a very strong framework and perspective that which we're coming from, and that sure. is Wilay of Emir Mu'mineen and following the 14 Masumin. And course. based on that, we work together very well in our mental health work with the ulama, with the community members, with the generations. So we find that we are looking at each of the uh, kind of lifespan, if you like, sure. child and adolescent, uh, working age adults, seniors, we work across the range. There's a whole spectrum that is you're working And because with. we're working from a faith-based perspective, we have the same platform and we're coming at it with our mental health expertise or skill or knowledge or training, whatever we, we might sure. want to call it, but we're coming together because of our faith. Understood. It's interesting over here, and I'll point out a couple of things, that your profession brings you together with a number of individuals overcoming the race barrier. What allows this diversity, the common factor between you guys is your profession. And the funny thing is over here, our faith is the one that is driving people apart. But let me just make one thing, um, or let me say one thing as a comment before I go back to the panelists over here, is that perhaps one thing, perhaps one thing that makes it very easy is that you have a common language of communication between all of you within your respective fields, whether you're psychologists, therapists, so on and so forth. You all are communicating in the same language. However, when you come down to our centers, you have different centers holding programs in different languages, and the fact that you can't communicate in that language in itself ends up becoming a barrier. There's just a point of contemplation over here. But thank you for your comment. Thank you. I just wanted to say for the sister's first question, is that what are we actually going to do about it? And she's mentioned that some, you know, the youth of today are actually going and being proactive and doing something right. about it and, and eradicating the racism that we, we have within ourselves. Right. I think the first and foremost thing to do is, that, is to admit it. Of course. To admit that there is a problem. To admit that we are racist. Tell you, who admits on this? Is this, you and I can sit here we can have a hundred shows like this and we'll admit there's racism within our community day in, day out, every yeah. day of the week. So yeah. the who needs to do this? People Absolutely. People who I, run the community. Yeah. And How the, do people who run the community, now we're yeah. getting to the meat and bones of solution. Uh, unfortunately, we're also running short on time because we're almost just within the dying minutes over here. So just to try and wrap this up and give at least something to our viewers, to ourselves, to the audience, <coughs> excuse me, in regards to a roadmap on how we need to go forward. So the leaders of the community need to be addressed. What's the platform in which they're supposed to be addressed? Is it, are we supposed to have mass protests? Are we supposed to go out and, um, uh, you know, um, in, in the AGMs, you know, the infamous AGMs where even, you know, all type of chaos and, uh, you know, mayhem opens, accounts being, uh, don't even get me started, man. But w w what is the platform? Let me just ask Haji Abu Shahab because he's part of PR as well. Go on, Haji. Um, we want to, you know, as brief as possible, keeping in time. We need solutions over here, leaders of our community. We are suffering from racism. How do we need to? Brother rightly mentioned about admitting that there is racism within communities. 
um, whether Khawja, Iraqi, Iranian, and so on. Right. Well, I think the, the way, if you wanted to admit it, if I admit it, if you do it, and he does it, and she does it, nothing's going to change. But it has to be from the hierarchy. How do we get to the higher? How do we get to the hierarchy? We go to the marja or representative we have. When they accept that there is a racism, and then they so admit they, it or denounce it, as in right. Islam denounced it, admit it, and then the, how we uh, tackle it or how we eradicate it comes from up all the way down to us. Within our management, we, didn't, we don't have anyone from, let's say, Khoja community. Right. Why? I'm not in the Khoja community's uh, management, for example. Why? So if the, the, our, let's say, high manager comes and admits and then provides a solution for he knows it with regard to Islam, Ahlul Bayt, Ahlul Muslim, Quran, and so on, and all step by step comes down to, to us, then I think it's easier to, to know it. Because now I'm, I'm saying in here, I said, I don't see racism in here, but there is a racism. I admit right. it, but I'm not going to change anything. I can't change anything. But I, I think where, where you can make a start is to call it out. Of course. It begins at home. And this is the point of one it of these It begins at home. This, this is, you know, spot on the point of having a show like this. And inshallah, it gets the uh, exposure that it deserves so that we can't change the world with this one show. But what we can do is, we can, put the, we can get the ball rolling. Plant the seed. Plant the seed. We have a question from uh, esteemed uh, guest as well. It's a very well-renowned khatib from what I know from him. I can see from here. Samahat Sayyid Ali Nawab. Salaamun Alaikum. Salaamun Alaikum wa rahmatullah. First of all, I would like to congratulate Imam Hussein TV and you yourself for organizing this very well uh, presented and organized program. Inshallah, it continues. Uh, there are two points I wanted to clarify. Uh, as an individual who studied in the seminary and who's experienced the environment uh, of the seminary up close front. The fact that we don't have an African merger, because this is one of the comments, unfortunately, that I heard in this program today. And it's very well sitting here in the furthest point of the world, uh, away from the Hausa in Najaf or in Qom, and to come and say that we don't have an African merger and our Hausa system or Marjaiya are racists. And this is a very big claim. In the current climate, we are having problems and we are having issues. Inviting the youth to come and follow our marja'iyya and do taqlid of the maraja. Of and for us to come and claim or come and say without any solid rock evidence that, that our marja'iyya or our house are racist, that's a very big claim to say without evidence. The fact that we don't have African marja'iyya doesn't mean that the house is racist. We have one of the most senior maraja that the world of Tashayu had ever seen was the Turk. He was Turkish. Right. We have Pakistani maraja who are currently in Iraq and who've contributed greatly in the success of Tashayu and, and the Pakistan. saving of Tashayu. Sure. We have ulama and maraja who are currently leaving their family and children and their friends back home and staying all their life in Najaf just to protect the science of Ahlul Bayt who are from Afghanistan. Of course. We have ulama and maraja who are from Bahrain and Lebanon and other parts of the world. Sure. So claiming that we don't have African merja doesn't mean that the Hausa has not opened, uh, opened its doors to people. Right. It's the marja'iyya needs an individual who sacrifices his life for the sake of marja'iyya. There are individuals who left the world and the desires of the world to come and reside in the Qabristan of Wadi Salam for a big part of their life as poor individuals not having any water or food to eat and drink just to become maraja. These are individuals who they sacrifice their lives. We have individuals, no doubt, that come to Najaf or go to Qom or go to Sayyidah Zainab to study from the brothers from the African uh, communities. And they decide, they themselves decide to go back home to continue educating their family and communities. Marja'iyya mm -hmm. needs individuals to continue their studies until 50 or 60 or 70 years. And regardless of that, the Imam of the time helps an individual to become a marja'. An course. individual can become, they study 
all the required sciences of Marjaiya, but at the same time, you don't see them having the support and the help of the Imam of the time. It needs personal elevation for you to become a Marja and to reach that higher status. Thank you very much. 100% agreed. I think um, in, when it comes in regards to be fair and to put a closing statement to this as well so we can wrap up our segment for today, is that it's fair to say that on this, uh, uh, you know, on the issue of um, racism when it comes to the Marjaiya, in the event that, um, you know, in the event that uh, evidence is found, clearly you have evidence that you have suggested towards, or whether evidence is found or not, one thing that is absolutely uh, important for us to understand is that the Hausa Ilmiya as an institution and the values of the Hausa is one thing, and the actions of individuals who claim to be within the Hausa or within that Hausa circle, the action of the individual is different than the, the values of that actual institution. Just like the way we say Islam is one thing and Muslims is something else. But inshallah, hopefully, we're going to. Yeah. I never said the merger are racist. No, no, of course. Don't get me wrong. I said institutionally. Institutionally, there understood. Racism. There is a big difference in that. Of course. Just one more thing before you close. Um, one of the things we can do, we have welcome to our mosque day. Yes. We can have a day where we have an anti-racist day. No one community has a day which is dedicated in our centers to a day of non-racism or anti-racism, to stand up against sure. racism. Football has campaigns, kick out racism. Every right. sport, every corner has. Do you know what? Even so during Shahr Ramadan, now. even during Shahr Ramadan, we have the interfaith iftar. What if there was supposed to be an iftar one day? just for all Shias from all different communities to yeah. sit down and break bread together. I no, love that. And, That's a and, fantastic and just, solution. And just to bring in black people, white people to our community, to see we are normal people, that we should have a kick out racism day. Of course. Within our community and for people around us as well. Oh, 100%. I agree with that. I think this is going to be the last question that we got to take and we got to wrap things up for tonight. Uh, Christopher, is it from the brother's side or the sister's side? Brother, Bismillah. Assalamualaikum, dear brother panelists and sister Rebecca. Um, it was a quick question to say, I mean, we have two cemeteries in London, one in South, one in North. Two cemeteries? Uh, yeah, two graveyards where uh -huh. um, Shia brothers are buried. We have a number and of graveyards. Yeah, we have okay. a number, but there, there's, there's two that uh, apparently, uh, it was a question to say, I mean, John bin Huwey was an African uh, Christian who, who was buried with, in, in Karbala with Imam Hussein. Right. Uh, there was a 16-year-old uh, a brother, and I think Abu Shahbaz uh, had, um, had mentioned uh, just now earlier, um, who, who was rejected from being buried in this graveyard here in London um, because they were not from a, from a Khoja background. Uh, if, we can't, if we can't get this done here in London, in the UK, where we say racism is, is against the law and it's, it's, it's something that's as big. If we can't start that from here, what, what, are, your, what are your thoughts on that, Sheikh? I understand. Let me just say things um, as well over here, not again to sugarcoat in the words of Haji no, no, Abu Shabash, but let me, let's just get I, lines. I can tell you exactly sure. what the Before we dive into this, let's just get some lines and some ground rules over here. Um, number one, as a presenter or in the channel, we don't want to end up where certain centers or certain races or ethnicities feel that they are being targeted Absolutely. and this show is there to bash them. No, we're trying to understand the situation and uh, if there was a markaz, for example, that was involved, I think, in my humble opinion, it would be best to get, for example, an official answer from somebody within that markaz so that you get two sides of a story. Taking things on face value, taking things on face value, and um, it's a very sad event. I mean, when you look at things, and this is where it points down to, Habibi, when you run your center as per the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, you open the Risala Amaliyah for any marja taklid. Baba, burying a dead person is wajib kifai. Wajib kifai, regardless of your whether you come from this background or that background. So if our centers or the people that are in charge when it comes to burials and things like this, if this is our criteria, then you know it makes things simpler. Now I understand there is finances and the cost of a grave involved and so on and so forth. I can, I can elaborate. No, I don't think it's finances. If, if, if I can elaborate on this. Um, there was no refusal to bury the first thing. Okay, um, The community did offer to bury. They offered to do gusel, kafan, the hearse, the burial, 
just not in a particular part of the graveyard. Yeah. Not in a particular part. There are issues behind that because there is a sizable community. They pay a monthly subscription if you're part of the burial committee. Uh, or sorry, about Spin. part of the burial fund. So yeah. you must understand if there's 100 graves and 200 people, um, there's already a problem. So it's, the fact that the kid was 16 is very sad. Um, there were ways around it, but no one was prepared to do that. This is number one. Number two, you must understand the community and people who run the community are two different things. The of community course. was never, never against burying that kid. In fact, I don't think these are communal decisions. No. As well, there's a but, committee that is But placed. there was, within the same graveyard, there was offers to bury, but there was a, but there are always people who want to create an issue. And there was a couple of people within our own community who were like, well, not there, it's got to be right here. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. If there's an offer and acceptance, um, things were all fine until a certain morning, a certain person decided to cause more problems than necessary, and then the whole thing blew out of proportion and everyone got very upset. Sorry to cut so you off, Haji Abu Shabazz. Uh, no. Sister, do you want to say something? I, I, well, you were I was to also make a involved comment. in that um, yeah. because, and this is in, you've been talking about the generational differences um, in the communities and um, I ended up getting involved because I noticed this boy's friends um, were running a petition to for him to be buried in the graveyard so I just kind of shared it without thinking too much about it but it right. ended up um, like you say getting very complicated but from what I learned after also speaking to uh, certain community members was that there's a two tier membership system so um, to be buried in that graveyard, um, you must be a member of the, this particular sure. Jamaat. But to be a member of this Jamaat, you have to belong to one particular ethnicity. Wow. So the issue of ethnicity is, uh, is built into uh, the rules and regulations as to whether you can be buried or not. Sure. And, and, I, and I asked to see the constitution and I saw that, you know, I mean, the argument coming back was, oh, well, it's because the family, they hadn't paid any membership. They weren't members of this, of this uh, community. But what people were not saying is that in order to be a member of this community, you, you must to belong be a to part one of ethnicity. A certain ethnic group. Yeah. We have well, Haji Gulam who's part of a burial committee. Yeah. Just to put you on the spot over here. What's your Before take on my this? time. Before your time, uh, we literally need to wrap sure. up, guys. Um, uh, the producer's been making a couple of comments in my ear as well. Um, you know, one statement response. How do you deal with issues like these? Being part of a burial committee, wajib kifai, yeah. and you've got all these constitutional issues that are over here. Yeah. What do you think is the way forward to ensure that an issue like this doesn't happen again? Well, first of all, it was unfortunate that it happened, but it happened, and we must learn from it. And uh, in order to learn from it, we also have, if, I don't know if Sister Rebecca is aware, that we are actually going through the process, our Jamaat is going through the process of having a new constitution. Right. Um, and uh, I believe there are obviously causes so in there. constitutional review to ensure that this Absolutely. doesn't happen over there. Yeah. Alhamdulillah wa shukran. I'm going to stop you over here um, for the remaining couple of minutes. We really need to end this show. Uh, we have gone over our time by quite a bit. This being a pilot show, the fact that we've been afforded more time shows the uh, um, how well the topic has gone. It's a very sensitive topic. Um, it's a very heated debate as well, but at the same time, there's hopefully there are more occasions for us to get together, inshallah, on this. However, to close, I think a couple of things that we need to take home over here is in understanding um, the, the, the manner and the circumstances, the mentality which allows uh, racist behavior to, be, to prevail or to occur within our societies. The first thing that was recognized is a lack of spirituality, a lack of taqwa. If we were to put our full belief and live our lives as per the pure teachings of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt, with the agenda of Ahlul Bayt and agenda of Quran coming before any other agenda, we would not be dealing with all these issues over here. It's one thing to be Shia by name, and it's something else to be Shia by action. Number two, what is uh, apparently also what is also very apparent is our affiliation with culture. 
there is a fine line that needs to be drawn over here. It's not wrong to be cultural to a certain extent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also points that out within the Quran that we have created you from different tribes. So having your culture and having an affinity towards a culture per se, there is nothing wrong with this. The problem is that when this culture now becomes a reason to start practicing and start behaving in a prejudiced manner towards other people, be it at a communal level, at, an, uh, at a personal level, or even at an institutional or governmental level. Let me leave one thing over here because there is one thing that brings all of us together, and that is Imam al Hussein, Sayyid al Shuhada. You come into the haram of Imam al Hussein. Yawm al Arba'in, you see flags from around the world. This Imam al Hussein is this mantik that brings people, uh, regardless of their ethnicities, regardless of their colors, and even their sects, under this domain of love. Let me end with this anecdote and this act incident from the day of Ashura as something for all of us to ponder upon. Joan, as was already mentioned, Joan was an Abyssinian slave from Abyssinia, present-day Ethiopia. When he was martyred on the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein goes and puts his cheek on the cheek of Joan, and he kisses Joan on the forehead. This is a master, Imam al Hussein, dealing with his companion Joan. The same action Imam al Hussein performs for Ali al Akbar, his son, flesh and blood Bani Hashim. When Ali al Akbar fell on the battleground, Imam al Hussein goes up to him before he says, Wa ala dunya ba'daka al -afa. He sat down by Ali al Akbar and he put his cheek on the cheek of Ali al Akbar. The same action of Imam al Hussein for his son Ali al Akbar, the Sayyid from the Sadat of Bani Hashim. Imam al Hussein performs the same act for Joan. How he treats his son and how he treats this person from Abyssinia. One of the lead lessons of Karbala is that there is no room for racism within Tashayyu. And if we were to embark upon the lessons of Imam al Hussein with our actions through grassroots movements, I'm sure, inshallah, the next time we'll be sitting on this panel, there will be much more pleasant things we'll be talking about, inshallah, together with a Risala Amaliyah of a Marjat Taklid, inshallah, from Africa, inshallah. And with this, I would like to thank each and every one of my uh, esteemed guests on the panelists, thank you very much for your expertise and um, for a very lively debate, inshallah. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the sake of Imam al-Hussein that you are all successful in all your individual endeavors in uh, serving Ahlul Bayt. A big thank you for the audience that is here and for our viewers. Inshallah, join us next week on Thursday Night Talk as we take on another contemporary topic uh, for you to benefit from. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.